Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Matt Hines, who is a prolific author and nationally recognized award-winning blogger. He is president and founder of Hines Marketing with 15 years of marketing, business development, and sales experience from a, from a variety of organizations and industries. He is a dynamic speaker, memorable not only for his keen insight and humor, but his actionable and motivating takeaways. Matt's career focuses on consistently delivering measurable results with greater sales, revenue growth, product success, and customer loyalty. Matt is a repeat winner of the top 50 most influential people in sales lead management and top 50 sales and marketing influencers. And today, we are going to talk about sales enablement best practices for B2B marketers. Matt, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great. Thanks very much for having me. No problem. I'm super excited to dig into this topic. And uh, after seeing you recently speak at CM World, I... Uh, know that you are um, going to have some great insight and your bio lives up to the truth as far as uh, your not only your keen insight but your humor <laughs> that, that was a uh, you definitely uh, lived up to that so kind of just uh, dig into everything first want to let the listeners out there have you explain what sales enablement is well, to me, sales enablement is best uh, defined by what it, by how we measure it. I think of sales enablement is focused on increasing the efficiency of the sales organization, helping them spend more time actively selling, as well as increasing the conversion rate of their opportunities into closed deals. So if we can help them convert more and do it faster, um, that is the ultimate measure and value, I believe, of sales enablement. Okay, now you're saying we, you mean the marketing team, correct? I do, yeah. I mean, I think sales enablement, you know, historically has really come out of sales operations, uh, but I think mm -hmm. sales ops has often been in more of a reactive and administrative role. Uh, I think sales enablement is a great uh, opportunity for marketing to embrace more than their traditional role, to really more actively support uh, more of the sales funnel, and, and a huge part of sales enablement is content. It's stories. It's, it's ensuring you've got the right message for the right prospect at the right stage of the buying journey. And so that is, you know, it's, it's, it's perfectly suited for marketing to own that and create really more consistency and velocity of customer conversations. Okay. Now, I always like kind of start from the beginning to end when we're talking about how something works or something pieces together or how marketing can help. And I, and I assume it kind of starts at the beginning for marketing to help with sales as far as you know, who you sell to, like buyer personas and, and all of that, and then mixing, mixing in a lot of the things I think we're going to talk about as far as, you know, the campaigns and, and awareness and all of that. So I'd like to um, kind of start, start on the top and work our way through to the end, if that's all right. And uh, sure. like to have you maybe talk about at the beginning how marketing can help with providing buyer insights as far as, like, who should sales go after? How can marketing help there? Well, I, I think the you know the marketing has a perfect opportunity to really own the customer the customer personas to understand in your target organization what does the buying committee look like. You know, CEB tells us that on average in B two B among B two B buyers, there's now 6.8 individuals that are actively involved in making a purchase decision. So it's not just understanding who is the buyer; it's understanding who are are the buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, each of those individuals uh, often each of those individuals often have their own. Uh, goals, they have their own perspectives, uh, so they need their own set of messaging. And I think where we see a lot of account-based marketing programs come into play is building consensus and coordination among those different people, sometimes from different departments, very often from disparate perspectives, to build mm -hmm. internal consensus towards filling a need and ultimately choosing your solution. Mm -hmm. And I would like to just kind of give a shout out to Adele Ravella. I think she's a great resource for helping you. Um, are you familiar with Adele? Yeah, no, she's one of the best. Uh, you know, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of great people in the content marketing world and the persona world. You know, Adele literally wrote the book on target <laughs> personas. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it, you, know you, you, you do, you do, uh, you do well to follow sort of her perspectives, but I think, you know, just simply, you know, understand who the primary players are, you know, different, you know, differentiate decision makers from stakeholders and influencers understand the different stages they're going through as they make a decision, including stages that have nothing to do with your product or service and simply mm -hmm. have to do with committing to a change for themselves. 
Um, what does that change mean? How does it rep what does it represent for each of those individuals in that group of 6.8? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know Adele and uh, Adele's a great person to learn from. Okay. Now, so let, let's assume you know we've done our homework and you figure out the buyer or the 6.8 buyers, and you got your correct and accurate buyer insights. You know, how, how and where can this information be best utilized? Like, what, what are some good areas? What are some good examples? And maybe you'd like to point out. Well, everywhere. I mean, honestly, I think a lot of people, a lot of times, personas get developed, um, and then they're applied to content developed. They're applied to marketing campaigns. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, I, I can't think of anything uh, that is in front of one of those target prospects that shouldn't be driven by those target personas. I think probably the biggest place, you know, sort of, we talked about, started talking about sales enablement, is making sure that the messages coming from sales reflect those personas as well. Uh, way too often, you know, sales is, is is left to their own devices to write their own content, and it's not that they're good. It's not that they're not good writers. It's just that, you know, they have no, they have no direction, and oftentimes they don't have access to those personas you painstakingly put together, and so they often will come to come through with messages that, while good, may be different than what you're trying to get across. That don't don't drive as efficient of a throughput on helping someone better clarify and understand a potential need, create some urgency, and move a deal forward. Mm -hmm. And sales might be too caught up in the weeds. You know, they might, they might get a little tainted with, with what they think is important with, just because they keep saying it over and over. And, and maybe marketing has can kind of take a step back and look at the big picture and, and really do the research. Is that is that kind of a, a point or a, that you would agree with or disagree with or expound on? Uh, we certainly see that quite a bit, um, but I think that it's, you know, it, I think every department in the organization, you know, you see a lot of, you know, differences and sort of conflict sometimes between sales and marketing. I believe in the vast majority of the time people are working with the best of intentions. You know, marketing gotcha. is not trying to deliver bad leads. Sales is not trying to just shoehorn people into deals without it, making sure that they need it. Um, but I think left to their own devices, you know, sales wants to sell. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, unless you can put a case in front of them that says, listen, like you're not going to compel someone to move forward unless they have a fundamental need. You have to sell the hole before you sell the drill. Um, you know, unless you buy off on that and then, hey, here's some tools, here's some messages, here's some templates, here's some structure on how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that, you know, in the same way that, you know, marketing needs to understand that a chatty prospect is not a qualified prospect. Mm -hmm. Someone who attends your webinar isn't necessarily someone who's ready to buy in the next 30 days, right? And so there's a coming together of sales and marketing against common objectives that I think will help them find quite a bit of common ground. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and, and this is, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It kind of is a new thing. You, you know, in the last couple of years that you hear this, like, sales marketing, you're, you're, you need to get together. You need to get in the same meetings, you know, and it's not a sales meeting. You don't have a marketing meeting. You have a sales and marketing meeting, and it sounds like that's what you're a huge proponent of, and I think it goes along the lines of what uh, many of the other, other experts out there that I've been, you know, following and continue to follow and listen to are saying. So uh, everybody pay attention. Here's yet another expert out there that's saying, hey, sales marketing, hold hands. Get together, talk, talk, talk everything out. Let, let's get aligned. Um, top of mind awareness, obviously, has always been critical. I mean, that that's you know mainly the role of marketing in general. But can you dig into some ways that marketing teams can do this? Um, possibly even on you know on a well, let's just dig into that. Uh, dig into like some top of mind awareness. How salespeople, I mean, marketing can do that. That will help sales. Sure. Well, I think first is just the the approach that's important. I, I I don't really want to be known. I want to be I don't want to be known for something. And that for something, I'd rather it not be my product or service. I'd rather it be sort of a specific outcome, or solving a particular pain, or helping someone mm -hmm. achieve a particular outcome that they care about. And I think you can do that without really helping people understand anything about your product or service simply by sharing information, becoming a trusted expert in a particular category. So, you know, driving awareness isn't making sure that everyone in an unaided way can give your demo for you. It's having people, like, when they, re when they hear a term, they think something. When you hear Volvo, you think safety. When you hear mm -hmm. Porsche, you think speed and high end. I mean, you think about sort of what brands mean. Independent of what's under the hood, you start thinking by association about what that brand means. And I think everyone has the opportunity to really build a reputation for themselves um, as someone that is approachable and someone that earns ongoing attention from their prospects. 
So ideally, a greater and greater percent of your addressable market starts to seek you out and come back because you're providing value in some consistent way around a consistent theme. And I think, you know, this is where content marketing can really play a big role because, mm-hmm. you know, companies can create and curate content around some central themes so people start to associate them with those themes. And, you know, when you're known for a theme, when you're associated with approaching a, and, and, a, and, and uh, sort of a uh, tackling a particular problem, when people have that problem, they'll come to you for advice. And uh, there's been many studies that show psychologically that people make a connection in their head between you understand this problem, therefore you may have a solution for me. Um, mm-hmm. Just because you understand and create good content doesn't mean you have the best solution, but that is the connection most people make in their heads, um, mm-hmm. which makes you as the seller the incumbent when someone comes back to you and says, I now have this problem, help me. You've really explained that really well. I mean, I think a lot of people don't quite understand content marketing all the way. I've always, I always call it the uh, simplest and hardest thing to understand. It's, you know, it seems it's not a linear way of thinking, you know, but once you get it, you're like, oh, that's what it is, <laughs> you know. But I think, I think you, uh, I think you really, really explained it really well there. I appreciate you um, explaining it that way. Now, and you might have already kind of answered this, but you might have something else to say. I don't know, but you know. Creating brand awareness for like big brands, like you mentioned, Porsche and Volvo, and you know you have your Nikes and Cokes of the world. Um, you know, you're a small, you know, small business owner. You're marketing, marketing person for a small company. It, it kind of sometimes is overwhelming, and it's like, well, yeah, that's great, but give me a million dollar budget, and I could do it too, right? But what about smaller companies? And, and again, you might you might have kind of the same answer, but how, what about smaller companies? How, how how can they create the same sort of brand awareness with their target markets? Well, I mean, does a company of one count? Um, you know, yeah. and I uh, hate to, you know I, I try not to use myself as an example in any of these, but I mean, I think about you know when I first started Heinz Marketing about eight years ago, uh, there was <laughs> there was just me and a laptop and a bus pass. I mean, there was nothing mm-hmm. else, right? And, I didn't have mm-hmm. a budget. I could, you know, I didn't. I, I wasn't using any. I was using constant contact to fling a few emails out every once in a while. So, you know, what I did have was a WordPress blog, and I opened mm-hmm. a Twitter account. And I tried to think about, okay, what's the kind of content I want to be known for? What's the mm-hmm. kind of content that my that the people I want to attract to my business are going to be interested in? Mm-hmm. And you know, put my hard hat on and started writing, started sharing, started curating, and and that continues to this day to be foundational for us as a business. I mean, we've been investing mm-hmm. in that for many years now. But, you know, I and, – and look, I mean, not every – you know, as some people, writing comes easier than others, and some people, content creation is easier. Some people, time management is easier. So, look, I'm not going to say it's easy to be consistent and do this on a regular basis, but I also believe that we're living in an amazing time when you can create advantage for yourself. You can create an audience. You can own a media channel with zero cost if you're taking advantage of and, you know, digging into and putting in the time and effort to create it. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean look at you. you said eight years ago, and now you're the one of the top 50 most influential people in sales and lead management, right? And you started as a company of one, and, and, and you basically just practiced what you're preaching now, right? That's basically what you did much, now. Yeah, I mean, and it, yeah. yeah and, and, you know, and what's interesting about that is, I mean, you know, you know, influencer lists and whatnot, like, we're never the goal. It still isn't the goal. Like, it's nice. It's it's it's, it's nice uh, validation for what we're doing. And clearly, you know, I'll take it because it helps drive leads in the door as well. But um, it was never about becoming and getting on any list. It was about <laughs> just leveraging the, the channels I had in front of me with zero dollars. Um, mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it's, I think the, it's an opportunity that almost anyone has. I mean, I look at people – you know, you know, that have come, that have gone from, you know, nothing to make themselves into someone. I mean, one of my favorite examples to watch these days is actually Carlos Gill, um, who, you know, he was at LinkedIn for a while. I believe he's at BMC Software now, but he has become synonymous with leveraging Snapchat in B2B. Um, he's done a number of keynotes. He's obviously got a, you know, popular Snapchat channel. He does videos. Um, and he, he is, comp- he is just self-made and, and, and he's, pr- and he'd be, I'm sure he'd be proud to say the same thing, but he's just he's put his hard hat on. He's he's uh he's grind he's he continues to grind every day. He uh focuses on building value for his audience and he's made something amazing for himself, um, just by being himself, by being generous, by sharing good content. Mhm. Yeah, so basically your advice for small, big, medium, 
gargantuan company. It's all the same, basically. It, it, it's it's put, get the message out about how you can be helpful, how you you know what you want to be known for, what you what you want to help people with, and then consistently just do that, but do it on obviously a quality level. So yeah, so it looks well, like it's a um, level, and I think in respond, you know, be generous, be responsive. Um, you know, mm-hmm. create a two-way level of communication. I think the bigger the company gets, the less likely you have individuals that are willing to step out and play that role themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that, you know, we don't want to follow buildings and logos. We want to follow people. We want to hear from people. And sometimes mm-hmm. the smaller the company, the easier it is for someone to sort of be the face of that company or someone to step out and be, be a representative of that company. But I think the more often people can – uh, leverage personality and humanity and emotion in their content and in their marketing, the, the, the better it works. Well, I think I think uh, a lot of people know this, but yeah, buying decisions are actually emotional decisions. They're not they're not analytical decisions. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. Now that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, you know, you have you know brand awareness that you're creating. You're you know you're becoming your company as a trusted source. But, you know, circling back to the whole sales enablement with marketing and sales, how, how, can a marketing, how can marketing and marketing departments help create name recognition for individual salespeople? And or do you feel like this is something that's really important and marketers should focus on, or should it mainly be more about the company and its brand awareness? Well, I mean, it's always going to be a little bit of a mix of both, right? But I think that I think it is important to build relationships and to create a bond between prospect and seller. And let's not pretend that the seller is a building. I mean, you know, I think a lot of companies are concerned about individual salespeople building to their own personal brand, and when they walk out the door, they walk out the door with that. Well, mm-hmm. that's always going to be a challenge with any employee that you have. You're always going to lose some, you know, intellectual capital. You're going to lose something you know, internally or externally when people leave. But in the meantime, I'd rather leverage that. And I'd rather leverage the fact that, you know, people can build relationships, that people want to follow other people, not buildings and logos. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, you, you as a marketing team can empower every sales rep with content, with tools, with processes that they can follow to regularly and uh, far more frequently engage a wider, scalable audience of prospects. Uh, mm-hmm. It's everything from curating content into their social channels to remembering to send someone a happy birthday card. Um, you know, there's a thousand things you can do as part of that, some more scalable than others, but all of it is best done when it's people building relationships with people. Gotcha. Now, I'd like to move on to lead nurturing, nurture campaigns. Um, you know, these these words get thrown out a lot. Um, and they sometimes feel like they mean similar things. Sometimes they seem like they mean different things. But I, I would like to kind of have you explain, because I, I think that this is one of the things that's really right up your alley and, and I've heard you talk about. And I'd like to see how you can explain. Well, first of all, just explain what, what, what these are. And, and then I'd like to have you explain some good ways these can be accomplished, the lead nurturing and nurture campaigns. Sure, sure. I mean, and so – I think in general what I've found is, you know, usually between 10 and 15% of inbound leads are qualified and ready to buy, and something between 60 and 65% of inbound leads are qualified and not ready to buy. So you've got an mm-hmm. audience where you've got the right person at the right company, they just don't have the level of urgency or a particular interest or, or context to move forward right now. Well, okay. you know, in an old world without lead nurturing, you'd have to just you'd throw them back in the sea and then hope they catch your hook again someday, right? Mm-hmm. Today, you have the opportunity to stay in touch with them, to put more value-added information in front of them, to keep their attention, and in the process also build and reinforce and expand their understanding of the connection between you, your brand, and what you represent so that when the timing is right – they are more likely to come back to you, but, you know, you're also more likely to have the right content in front of them so you can help move them forward. So, I, you, know, it, it, you know, if I'm sitting in front of a CFO, I'm saying, listen, like lead nurturing, it has an exponential impact on lowering your acquisition costs and making your sales and marketing more efficient. There's a media replacement value from a traditional marketing realm uh, of lead nurturing that is highly material for companies that are, that are in a mature growth stage uh, sales environment. Now, now, on like a practical level, like how does this get accomplished? How do you do this? 
Well, it's um, I mean, I've seen some companies just do it very simply with what we were abbreviated the EFN, the email effing newsletter, right? It's just, mm-hmm. I mean, literally, it could just be like getting a little bit of content in front of people on a regular basis is valuable okay. enough that they see your name and they associate that with goodness. If you want to take it another step forward, you can say, well, segment salespeople for marketing people, segment your healthcare targets versus your manufacturing targets. So you can segment your, you can segment a million different ways based on different uh, groupings and contexts of prospects. But in its simplest form, lead nurturing is just staying in front of prospects. Um, gotcha. It can be done with your email epic newsletter. It can be done by a sales rep reaching out and sharing an article every once in a while. Um, the execution can take a lot of different formats. But, you know, what can you do at the end of the day? What are you doing to keep the attention of your prospects? Right? Mm-hmm. To earn a right to have that attention on a regular basis such that it's usually not a matter of if, it's a matter of when that particular qualified prospect has a need, you want to be there. And you want to mm-hmm. make sure they associate that problem and that, out, that that intended outcome with you so that you're the first call they make. Okay. So, like, what, what are your thoughts on, like, the – so you salesperson engages with a prospect that they don't buy, right? And then are you looking at possibly creating, like, a marketing automated program where – the salesperson drops them into, you know, that bucket or whatever you want to call it, and then they get pinged, what, every month, every couple months with, like, another piece of content that might be of interest to them? Is that Would that be one example of kind of staying in front in addition to, like, a monthly newsletter? Is that is that yeah. an example that you like? Yeah, you've got the idea. I would differentiate between nurturing leads and nurturing uh, stalled opportunities, though. And so here's how okay. I would differentiate those. If someone is a lead and they've never, you've never really had sort of an opportunity discussion, um, you know, maybe Mark, maybe sales has tried to qualify them and has found them not ready to buy. In most of those cases, you know, I think best practice is that lead goes back to marketing and marketing will uh, remarket to them. It might be in a newsletter format. It might be in a more contextual segmented drip marketing campaign. Ideally, mm-hmm. it's a combination of channels. So they're seeing you in email and social and across the web and maybe some events and direct mail. Um, I differentiate that from someone who becomes an opportunity and doesn't close. Uh, the majority of closed deals aren't closed lost. They're just closed not now, right? So we, mm-hmm. when we do uh, pipeline development for clients, we call that stage closed nurture. Um, and then you've got a combination of marketing doing outreach as well as sales doing periodic direct outreach. Because at that point, they actually have a, you know, a direct relationship with someone on the sales team, and so we want to leverage that as much as possible. Okay. Well, th- th- that really you know, leads me to my next point here. So n- now that a salesperson has engaged, is there anything else marketing can do at that stage, or is it mainly I've, I've passed the baton, you know, not counting the content with the monthly newsletters and stuff like that? And, and the answer might be I've passed the baton. It's now, now it's sales team. But is there anything else marketing can do at the stage of helping them through the sales process? Well, I think, you know, the answer to that is kind of back to the beginning of our discussion, sales enablement, right? I mean, there's there's certainly content that can help get the lead over to the sales team, but once sales has that con- that, that lead, you know, what conversations should they have in what order? Uh, what mm-hmm. tools do they have to better facilitate engaging with those prospects? Everything from, you know, communicating with the prospect to presenting a demo to presenting a proposal. I mean, I think about the technology stack that sits in front of the sales team, and I think that I feel like that's a sales enablement function that can be supplied by marketing. So, again, like back to the, you know, our definition of what can you do to make your sales team more efficient and what can you do to help them convert more deals. If, if it helps directly with one of those objectives, I think it falls into sales enablement, and I think it falls within the purview of a modern marketing organization. Mm-hmm. And, and it, this would be a combination of potentially some of it being automated and some of it being as they go through the sales process, it sounds like. You basically are like, here's your bullets. Right, you fire which one when you, when you feel like you need to fire. I mean, at some point, logic and you know normal conversation, I guess, comes into play. You know, in this day and age, it seems like you know there's so much talk about marketing automation and all these tools and technology and all this other mark tech stuff that you kind of get lost and you forget. Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> there is a there is a human and a logical element here, and you don't want to automate yourself where you lose yourself. You know, you lose the trust of the the contact because it looks automated, right? Um, so it, it right. sounds like it's, it's a combination of both is what I'm hearing. It absolutely is. Yeah, I mean, a good example of that is, is the idea of sales scripts. I have never 
seen a sales script that works. There is no script that you can use in every situation with a prospect. Now, you can script a voicemail. You can script an email template, obviously, and you can script the beginning of a conversation. But from mm -hmm. that point forward, you can have a sense of direction. You can have some bullet points of where you want the conversation to go. But to a large extent, once you get into a live call, like you're in improv time, right? I mean, you have to be good on your feet. You have to know where you want to go with that conversation. And you need, I mean, you're literally doing custom communication in each one of those times. So, I mean, this is, look, I mean, if you're doing B2B sales, unless you're doing something that is simple and transactional, which is a minority of situations, the human element is extremely important. Like, we're not going to get, we're not going to get rid of salespeople anytime soon for these complex deals uh, that need reframing, that need consensus building, that need someone that can help shepherd the customer to get to the right outcome, right? It's, you know, the, when people are doing this right and when salespeople are doing their job right, you're not advocating for your deal. You're advocating for the customer's needs. You're advocating for an outcome your customer desires. Uh, and, and when you've got those organizations with your 6.8 decision makers, um, you know, that, that requires a set of skill. It still requires a deaf human hand. Gotcha. Now let's let's move offline a little bit. Now um, you have a ton of experience in sales and marketing, and you're obviously super crazy versed with you know the cutting edge technology and tools and everything. But let's go, I guess, a little bit old school. What what are some offline non digital activities that that you've seen marketing play a role in helping sales with to maybe give some some possibly some tangible ideas, like some things that maybe are a forgotten lost art that, that uh, you've seen work for yourself and for that are continuing to work for other people. Sure. I mean, you know, a lot of the old quote-unquote traditional channels still work really effectively as long as you use them well. Uh, direct mail works really well. I'm sitting on the table in the back of my office right now is something called a man crate. Um, someone sent me this. It was part of a marketing campaign. And I kid you not, like I open up this cardboard box. Inside the cardboard box, it's this wooden crate that is glued together, and it came with a uh, a, a, crow, a small crowbar. I had to crowbar the damn thing <laughs> open, and there was something in it and a message. And, and you know, look, it's like that's not cheap. You can't do that if you're trying to market to millions of people. Um, but it made an impression. Like I've talked about it a lot. <laughs> it's still sitting here, and uh, people ask me what the hell is that thing. And I say, it's a man crate, and let me tell you about it. Let me tell you who sent me to it. Send it to me. So you know, why don't you give a shout really out well. to them? Let's give them a shout out so that so that that hard work so pays off is, for them. Yeah, no, the company is Avention, um, and uh, you know they're doing some great work in the uh, in the big data, um, ABM space, and um, it just it was it was just unique. It was different. It stood out. Um, you know, we've we've done a few things like that with you know for some of our clients that are targeting that have you know sort of small and strategic targets. You know, you don't have to go, you know, you're not looking for the lowest common denominator. You're always not always looking for the lowest cost per lead. Sometimes you do something to stand out, especially among those decision makers and senior people that are hard to get to. Um, mm -hmm. Events, like if you go to salesforce.com, a couple people in their you know, enterprise IT uh, services space, you know, what's your most effective marketing channel? And the answer I've heard at least two or three times now is dinners. Hmm. They do dinners with 20 or 30 people in the room, and 70% of them are prospects, and 30% of them are customers and partners, and they just have a conversation. It's a relationship-building opportunity. It, dif it differentiates them. It's memorable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can go on and on about a bunch of, you know, examples that are sort of quote-unquote old school. None of them have well, anything to do with digital. Look, I mean, the, the, channel, the channel is simply the conduit of an experience or a message or an outcome that helps mm -hmm. make you closer to a mutually beneficial uh, you know, sort of uh, resolution or outcome, and you can mm -hmm. get there in a variety of different. Yeah, and thank you notes, right? Send those thank you notes, handwritten. You know, go, 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 well, go, you know. And the beauty, of the, I mean, and thanks to the thanks to the uh, the World Wide Web, you don't even have to hand write them. There's a company called MailLift. You can you can integrate into Salesforce, or you can send them a formatted, a templated email. They have, I kid you, you can't make this up. They have a team of retired teachers that will handwrite your letters for you. <laughs> That is crazy. Well, I don't think anyone can match my handwriting, so uh, it, they'd have to find a fifth grader to. I'd have to contract a specific fifth grader to write for me. But you know, and, and to bring this kind of together with digital, and you mentioned ABM account-based marketing. If I'm, you know, reading between the lines or maybe within the lines of all of this, it's about narrowing down 
the people that you can then engage with on a higher cost, a dinner level, a, sending them a crate type of thing. Um, I, you're right. I promise you, you aren't one of 500 or, well, maybe they have a big enough budget for that, but most likely you weren't one of 500 people who got that. You were probably, there's probably a reason that you got narrowed down in some form or fashion and to bring technology. So I think you might know where I'm going at with that. If you want to kind of expand on that to bring the technology part, you know, to this offline um, specific part of how, how people can narrow that down. Well, I'm not even, I, I want to address it not by technology, but in terms of like business value, right? And this is where I think the reframe for marketers becomes really important. If you as a marketer are focused on generating leads, if your number one goal is to generate leads, you probably have a lead goal and you probably have a finite budget you're trying to stay within to generate those leads. But not every lead is created differently. Not every sale is created differently. What if I told you that a particular segment of your customer base not only converts to sales at a higher rate, but also it has a three time lifetime, three X lifetime value of your average customer? What are you willing to do to buy that lead? What are you, how much are you willing to spend to generate that prospect? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, if you start thinking about lifetime value, you start looking at metrics that are at the bottom, if not beyond, of the sales funnel, it changes the economics, it changes the prioritization of the way you think about what you might do in marketing. And I think mm. too often marketers and B2B marketers, even marketers in a complex market, are focused on volume. We're focused on economies of scale. We want to get as much impact out of stuff as possible. We like our up and to the right charts that show lead volume. Mm -hmm. I can care less about lead volume, and I bet your C-suite doesn't give a crap about marketing qualified leads. They want pipeline. They want closed mm -hmm. deals. They want margin. They want lifetime value. So mm -hmm. at minimum, start using the language of your business as a marketer, and ideally you start to focus your efforts on what's going to give you the best ROI on those business metrics. It's the executive, mm -hmm. the executive dashboard, not your operational marketing dashboard you should be focused the most on. So basically, it might be worth taking a you know a slice of your budget and going after some of these big fish in a with really really nice smelling bait, I guess. You know, really well, really go they after. They may not them. even be. They may not even be your biggest fish. I mean, if you look at your database, if you look at the trends in your business, you may find that there is a unique small segment, maybe a smaller type customer or a customer in a unique un un uh, un uh, unappreciated market that loves your product, that loves your service, mm -hmm. that sticks around longer, that spends more money. Um, hmm. So it's not always the biggest logos. I mean, like, you know, when people do account-based marketing programs, like, you don't go after the Fortune 100 just because they're the top 100 businesses. What are the attributes of companies that are most likely to need your services? What are the attributes of companies that tend to be your best customers? Your mm -hmm. top 100 logos may not be the world's top 100 logos. But you mm -hmm. still need to focus on where you can get deals and where you can get your best, most satisfied customers. Great point. Awesome point. Well, as we um, – to, to, awesome, great stuff. Thank you, Matt, for all of that. And, and as we – but now to kind of move a little bit further, say, say now as we approach, you know, you've got people, you're talking to them, they've nurtured, you're engaged, you're getting close, right? You're getting close to that sell. As we approach the close of the sale, are there ways marketing teams can help the sales team secure it there, or again, is it, is it, you know, is it the sales job to kind of close and finish it off? But is there anything marketing can do? So the fifth of six buying journey stages, according to Serious Decisions, is what Serious calls justify the decision. And I think that's a critical stage for marketers. I think once you get to the point where you have bought off, you've got a, you've got a high percentage of those six point eight. Uh, decision makers internally are, are bought off on what you're doing. What do you need to get, arm them with to go to the final decision maker to sign on the dotted line? What's the final set of decision making criteria? Is it an ROI calculator? Is it case studies? What can you do to mm. lower and reduce the risk, get the risk low enough to move forward that someone will finally say yes? And there's a lot of ways to do that. I mean, some of that is sales's job to sort of really cement that internal consensus so that they go to the decision maker with a unified front and say, we all believe we should do this. Gotcha. Well, you may have already set the groundwork to do that, but what other messages, what other supporting points, what case studies and areas of justification can you arm your sales team with that they can use with your prospects, use with those near-term uh, you know, deals 
to get them across the finish line. Gotcha. Yeah. So basically, you know, I, you know, I've always, even personally, kind of had a hard time, you know, thinking about it because it almost sounds like lead nurturing. You have this stage, this stage. This. Okay, now marketing needs to jump in now. But what you're saying is marketing, just think it through ahead of time. You know, think it through. Think of the, these buying stages and the content that would be necessary through those. And then, you know, obviously one of them is going to be closed towards the end of the sale. What would be something that would be compelling and develop that piece of content ahead of time and then just give, make sure the salespeople know it's at their disposal. It's not anything that they're necessarily needing to jump in in the, in the nth hour, the twelfth hour. It's something that they should have thought of in the first hour and, and got the sales team, you know, another bullet to use at, um, at the right time. That, and with the case study or white paper, or RI, whatever, you know, all those other examples you gave. Is it, am I hearing that right? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I think So I think, you know, there's, there's a couple ways to think about that. One is if you understand your customers well and you understand the buying journey they go through, well, you should be able to anticipate the needs from a messaging and justification standpoint they have at the end of the, trans, at the, end of the, excuse me, the process. But each organization is going to be a little different. And I think if you don't have the ability to be innovative and agile at the end of the process as well, um, you know, as a team, you know, this, there may be things marketing can provide, there may be things sales can brainstorm and deliver, um, there may be one, you know, objector inside that 6.8 you got to deal with and deal with in a custom way for the culture and politics of that organization. So, you know, there isn't a one-size-fits-all for everybody. Uh, I think your playbook and your content and your buying journey uh, execution can handle the majority of situations. But you got to also be prepared to, you know, kind of go to the war room uh, and get innovative and creative uh, to get more of those deals across the line. Cool. Okay. Just final, final one here. They're sold, right? Do uh, you have any examples of how marketing has helped with keeping clients as lifelong customers? Well, once someone's bought, I mean, you know, ideally the product or service is what keeps them on board, I think. But, you know, there's there's an opportunity clearly to, you know, resell, uh, to confirm the decision, to 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 uh, communicate uh, overtly the benefit people are getting, even if they're not seeing it or even if they're not calculating it themselves. Um, you know, I think the mistake a lot of companies make is they approach renewals at the time of renewal as opposed mm -hmm. to beginning renewal on day one. You know, you've got to constantly be thinking about what do I do to make sure that, that the renewal with this customer is a slam dunk, that it's, that it's done without, without a second guess? Um, you know, and part of that is just your product or service fulfilling on the promise that you started with. Mm -hmm. um, but the relationship people have with you, the way they feel about the relationship, the service they get, um, you know, sometimes people, you know, aren't choosing the best product in the market. Sometimes they're choosing that, that their favorite, someone that they feel mm -hmm. comfortable with. Especially mm -hmm. when they've got an existing relationship, it's painful to change vendors. It's painful to change to someone else. Uh, you'd rather just stick with what you've got. So don't give mm -hmm. people a reason to leave. Give them every reason to believe in you, to continue to favor you, and to stay with you. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, that that is something that gets forgotten a little bit here. Uh, business owners don't like to hear it. They want to sales marketing. Where are our sales numbers down? Well. At some point, your product needs to take over, right? <laughs> what, what, what you promised, you know, and what you what you sold. I, I guess Volvo, Volvo could have the best marketing and sales in the world, but if the cars weren't actually safe, well, then, you know, at the end of the day, people are going to stop driving them. So yeah, that, that's kind of forgotten a little bit. Well, awesome, Matt. I, I think we gave I, you gave a ton of ton of great pointers, great information. Um, I think you really explained how sales and marketing can really work together, specifically how marketing can, can help sales. Um, and uh, I would just like to see, do you have any parting thoughts at all before uh, we let you go? No, I think you know, we've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, and I think you know, the one thing I would just reinforce to marketers is you know, make sure that you are be seen and are acting as a profit center for the business. You know, get out of the the trap of reporting on operational metrics and reinforcing the organization that what you care about is uh, means to an end. Focus on the same metrics, the same goals that your sales team has. Uh, put your money where your mouth is on that as well. And uh, it's amazing to see the the, the, the sea change of how, how companies are how marketing departments are perceived and funded and supported uh, when that happens. Awesome. Matt, how can people continue to learn from you? Well, you can find us at uh, HeinzMarketing.com. It's H-E-I-N-Z Marketing.com. Uh, we're on Twitter at, at Heinz Marketing. 
Uh, if you have any questions for me directly, I'm just Matt, M-A-T-T, at HeinzMarketing.com. And, uh, yeah, we blog every day and, uh, you know, uh, try to be as generous uh, with our ideas as we can. And uh, or go to any one of these top conferences and they might uh, see you speaking, right? <laughs> Well, awesome, Matt. Hey, appreciate your time, appreciate your insight, your expertise, and uh, looking forward to the next one. Sounds great, man. Thanks very much. All right. Bye-bye.